G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we are continuing this series I've got going where I am predicting the best 22s of each club in the AFL for round one, 2027, so about three years from now. Uh, now, I use the term predicting quite loosely because that's not the point of this exercise. I'm not trying to actually try and get the best 22 right. Uh, what I'm trying to do is show what the given team might look like in three years. Once you take out a few retirements and then forecast the development of certain players, maybe some positional swaps, whatever, um, and you can sort of get a, a feel for how clubs are trending and what might be the case in three years. And it kind of points out a few list gaps as well. And, uh, you know, if there's problems arising in three years' time in terms of, like, weaknesses in certain positions, uh, that's probably where those clubs will focus in their recruiting, you would think. So today we're doing Port Adelaide, and I have done Bulldogs, Eagles, Sydney, St Kilda, and Richmond up until this point. I'm going to compile all this in a video uh, playlist on the channel, and uh, if you're unaware, I've already done a Port Adelaide 2024 analysis video as well on the channel that you can find. Port Adelaide are an interesting one. Uh, there is a handful of veterans that are probably about to leave the club, but a lot of their best players still probably approaching their prime. Uh, the two I'm considering, in, you know, uh, Butters and Rosie, obviously, and Horn Francis, probably the next one after that. Not that he's one of their best players yet, but they're, they're an interesting split in terms of their demographics, which I'll get into in this video. And it's interesting to see how their 22 is going to line up in three years, or at least I've had a crack, bearing in mind I am an Eagles fan, and I'm looking from the outside and trying to forecast certain things. So before I get into the video, if you could do me a favor, if you could consider to subscribe to the channel would uh, really help me out a lot. I'm trying to grow this channel uh, as quickly as possible, naturally. And, you know, it's a great place to find some AFL content um, where I'm going through team-by-team -team series at the moment until the season starts. I'll do some cricket content on the side. So if you want to subscribe, that would mean a lot. Cool. All right. So you may or may not have been following this series up to this point. This might be the first video uh, you've watched in this particular series. So what I usually start with is looking at the players who in three years are almost certainly not going to be on the list anymore. So I've only found four for Port Adelaide, which is interesting. In my head, they probably had a few more aging veterans than they do. Uh, but these are the four that I've pr pretty much ruled out of being in this analysis. Travis Boak will be 38 by then. Uh, Charlie Dixon, 36. Trent McKenzie will be 34 and Tom Cleary will be 33. Although the latter two are, you know, not quite best 22 or borderline best 22, I would have thought. So then uh, what I'm going to do is list the players that will be veterans at the time. And what I would define by veteran is, is about 30. That's what I'm going off in this uh, video. And I have got six or seven players actually that I'm going to keep in this squad for the purposes of this video, but I'll name them. So Oli Wines will be 32. Aaliyah Aaliyah will be 32, Junior Rioli 31, as will be Darcy Byrne jones Jeremy Finlayson, Ivan Soldo will be 30, and Ryan Burton will be 30. So I'm leaving all those players in, uh, but you've got seven players over 30 in three years' time, so it's kind of worth mentioning that. Uh, but not that many retirements compared to some of the other clubs I've done up to this point. So now what we're going to do is going to I'm going to show you my attempt at a best 22, which I use the tw a term 22 liberally because I've actually got 24 names there. Again, it's just a case of flash, uh, flashing out the, uh, the analysis as best as possible. So I'm going to break down what this chart that you're looking at is exactly. Obviously, it's a best 22. I'm sure you've seen one of those before, uh, but the colors are numbers specifically. So the green generally indicates my confidence to which they are likely to still be in the best 22 uh, in three years time and you know pretty much the locked and loaded ones you know butters and rosie uh, but th there's a few others like players that have given us good reason to think uh, that in three years time they'll still be best 22 yellow just means a little bit more speculative if i didn't rate them i wouldn't put them in the 22 so i wouldn't get too fixated on what's yellow and green and bearing in mind i am an outsider as well so i'm not saying i've nailed that as for the numbers uh, if you couldn't guess the first number in the bracket is their age at the round one of 2027 and the, uh, the second number there is an estimate of how many games experience they're likely to have. So how I've roughly done that, it's not going to be perfect, is if they're pretty much an entrenched best 22 player, uh, then I've gone 20 games a season, allowing for injury and suspension. So uh, across three years, they'll add 60 games. If they're a fringe player or you know potentially not in the team yet, then I've scaled it down a little bit. So not all players will have uh, had plus 60 or anything like that. But it's just a rough estimate because the idea of this exercise as much as anything is to see how mature this team's going to be and how experienced they are. Because uh, usually around that 50 games, at least in my opinion, is where we start to see players really take their game to the next level. So let's talk about this best 24. Okay, so I've got five green players. So in generally speaking, this is quite a settled 24 or 22 uh, compared to the one I did the other day. I didn't have to change too much for Port Adelaide and that really indicates that uh, a lot of their players are in their prime and their, their team is 
re- relatively strong. And we know that because they finished third in the home and away season. So uh, Dan Houston's still going to be there. I'd imagine Zerk Thatcher, Radagalia, and Aaliyah Lear are still going to be the, the trio down back, assuming Aaliyah Lear is still in. So part of my justification for putting certain players in green is also, like, from my perspective, what like, a competition are they likely to have in this 22? And I, I think I look at Port Adelaide's key, young key backs, and they've got a handful... The two I could find were Carl Marshall and Tom McCallum. So in terms of players that are likely to oust any of these three players, I think they have relatively strong job security. Had there been you know, another equally good key back there, then I might have made one of those key backs yellow, or both even. I hope that makes sense. So the fact that I just don't see those guys getting ousted considering the depth behind them. And I don't think Port Adelaide would recruit one unless things go really badly. Um, as for Burton, you know, he'll, uh, he's the best 22 player. I can't imagine he won't be there. Uh, the other one is Lockie Jones, who I project will have about 85 games of experience. He, he's not an entrenched 22 player yet, and that's kind of why he's yellow. I do like him, and I've got him on the halfback flank there. Uh, but yeah, just a, a, a couple of degrees lower in confidence, if that makes sense. Let's talk about the center line. Again, Bergman, uh, I don't know if he's going to be a wingman in three years' time. And this was the issue I had with plotting their 2024 best 22 because I just don't know exactly who's going to backfill that wing role in the absence of Dersma. I've chucked the wingers as Bergman like I did in the other video, so I might as well stay consistent. And Josh Sin. You know, I mulled over a few. There's like Kane Farrell, who I chucked on the bench there, um, and Lockie Jones, who probably could play wing. I think Jace Burgoyne is probably a shout as well. I thought Josh Sin has some nice attributes for a wingman, and he's a first-round draft pick, and um, while I haven't tracked him super closely, I give him a, a decent shout at being there, that spot, but open to comments, obviously, from Port Adelaide fans. The on-ball division is elite, obviously. Butters, Rosie, interestingly as well, 26 and 27. So these guys haven't even hit their prime. I'd say 26 and 27 is closer to the middle of their prime. And Jason Horn Francis then should, touch wood, have accumulated 100 games experience. So he'll be a much better player in three years' time, you'd imagine. So that's a dangerous on-ball division. Ivan Soldo as well. At this stage, I see no reason to put um, Jordan Sweet ahead of him. I think uh, he's clearly going to be more likely to be there than Jordan Sweet. The forward line, uh, this one is a little bit more interesting. Obviously, in the absence of Charlie Dixon, I had to mull over a few key forward options for Port Adelaide, assuming Todd Marshall is obviously going to be there. Um, and I have ousted Jeremy Finlayson, which I'll clarify shortly. But Ollie Lord, I think, is the best of the young prospects they've got. Uh, the, the, the other ones they've got uh, that I can find, Tom Scully, uh, not the former GWS and Melbourne Hawthorne player, uh, a key forward, 203 centimeter key, uh, key forward, and Xavier Walsh, who they just drafted in this year's rookie draft, I think. Uh, so, as far as key forwards goes, I think Ollie Lord, who has played some football and uh, you know played well in the final series, he's he's likely to be there, but he's still yellow because he hasn't played that much. So I'm reluctant to say that he's locked in to be in their best 22. I had a bit more confidence in Georgiatis. You plot this in three years' time, people are already unsure as to whether Finlayson is going to be best 22 round one next year. So you put it three years into the future when Georgiatis is hitting his prime, I think Georgiatis is the, the best player there. But Finlayson could be on the list still. Pal Pepper is a really good half forward. I'm, I'm happy to leave him there as, as a bit of a lock. Uh, Junior Rioli, I've only got in yellow purely because he can be inconsistent. And I do think he's a wonderful player, but at 31, is he going to be the same player as he has been at the best parts of his career? I'm not sure. I like to see it, but uh, I think at 31, I'm not super confident he's going to still be the player he is now. I could be wrong on that. It doesn't really matter, to be honest. And and Judd McEntee or McEntee, I would read that as McEntee, to be honest, but I find myself saying McEntee. Um, Yeah, I think he's probably a good chance to be in that best 22, but not an absolute lock yet, uh, but still a handy player there. So don't get too caught up with the fact that it's not green. Um, Okay, so the bench options, I've made Ollie Wines yellow because... I think he turns 33 that season. So I'm not 100% sure if he's going to have retired by then. It kind of depends to what extent the midfielders behind Oli Wines are pushing up. And I don't think this is a, a relative area of strength for Port Adelaide's list is up and coming midfield potential outside the best 22. I should clarify that because technically Butters, Rosie and Horn Francis are still up and coming. Uh, I mean, outside the 22. So, you know, it depends if, you know, say a Jackson Mead is outperforming Oli Wines at this point. Maybe Oli Wines, you know, calls it quits. And I'm sure they're going to draft other midfielders in between now and then as well. Uh, but anyway, Wines on the bench. Willem Drew should still be there. He's the best 22 player. Uh, Kane Farrell should still be there. Burn Jones as well on his day is very good. And at 31, still probably able to contribute. Dylan Williams had a good year this year. Um, that being said, it's still not a lock. And Jace Burgoyne's only played about 13 games, although 
he's shown some good signs as well. So those are the players I had roughly in the best 24. But again, it becomes hard to split the depth because I'm not a power fan. I don't watch these guys a lot. And to be honest, even if I was and I watched them a lot, it probably still wouldn't be definitive because, you know, they're young prospects. Some other, um, you know, players outside the 20. Four, if you want to go with that, that I have not mentioned. Uh, they just drafted Will Lorenz. Uh, I like the look of him as a wingman, but still speculative. Hugh Jackson's been on the list for a little while there. Uh, Jackson made, like I mentioned, and Dante Vicentini, they just drafted last year, I think, or in the mid-season. I can't remember, but a young Ruckman there. Uh, I mentioned Scully and Walsh as the young key forward. So there's, there's some developing talent at both ends with Marshall and McCallum down back, Scully and Walsh up forward. Uh, but generally speaking, there's depth and no immediate pressure on these guys to... Uh, develop into best 22 players because you know in three years time I think that key position key positions um, situation is still pretty settled in general the team is settled and the other you know there's some small forwards in Lachlan Charleston and Tom Anastasopoulos Anastasopoulos uh, who obviously I have no idea if going to be any good because they were just late picks so looking at the team overall in three years time there's no reason to think Port Adelaide still won't be as good as they are now in fact arguably there's potential to be better. When you consider the players that are likely to leave, Boak and Dixon haven't uh, necessarily been players that they've relied on in recent years. Obviously, both have been great at time. Boak is a champion of that football club. Uh, so Ollie Lord replacing Dixon. So I do think that Ollie Lord does have the potential to come in and mitigate at least the, the current day version of Charlie Dixon. Um, other than that, there's not too much disruption to this team as far as I can see. Maybe the you know a few years after that, it'll look a little bit different. But when you consider Buddy, Butters Rosie and Jason Horn Francis all in their prime, you could argue strongly, and this is considering that Port Adelaide do not have any trades or draft picks in the next three years, which they obviously will do if they don't keep trading their first rounders. They are in a very good spot for a long, sustainable window. I really do think that. Um, that team is strong. There's a good balance of experience and youth. Um, and they, they can add to that as well. So it's not perfect. No team that you forecast three years into the future is perfect, but there's some really nice options there. I think certainly uh, getting a wingman, whether internally or from externally, to uh, come into this best 22 over the next few years, and kind of immediately actually, is something they could consider. But overall, Port Adelaide's list shape kind of almost justifies them trading out of three drafts in the way that they have. I do think it's time to stop trading out of the first round, but we'll see. Anyway, guys, that's my take on Port Adelaide. Obviously, it's pretty nicely shaped. A couple of weaknesses here and there. Like I said, a wingman. Maybe, you know, backfilling a, a quality small forward if Junior Rioli and maybe McKenty are not in the 22 in four years or whatever, three years. But overall, pretty solid. Um, there's there's depth in positions. Key positions have been drafted. Um, yeah, well done, Port Adelaide. It's actually looking better than I expected. So there you have it, guys. Those are my thoughts. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, recommend it to a power fan if you if you'd liked it as well, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.